Hello and welcome to another episode of Decentral Lounge, uh, which is brought to you by Global Stake, uh, where your institutional, truly decentralized bare metal staking provider. Uh, today, we're excited to have a wonderful guest on the show, Mark Nichols uh, from Arbor Digital. Mark, for reference, is the product director at Arbor Digital, uh, and his journey is both unique uh, and inspiring because he's transitioned from being a professional tennis player and a coach to now a prominent figure in financial services. Uh, his background is with both Merrill Lynch, Charles Schwab, uh, based in New York as well as New Jersey. And over this time, he's honed his expertise in wealth management and applies all of this to the digital asset space today. Now, Arbor Digital, uh, Mark actually oversees the suite of SMA offerings, bringing innovative digital asset management solutions specifically to RIAs and other independent advisors. So Arbor Digital, for reference, they're at the forefront of integrating traditional financial services with this rapidly evolving world of digital assets. Uh, they provide expert guidance in this new frontier. So Mark's insights are especially uh, important given his background as a certified investment management analyst and a wealth management certified professional. Uh, so for those that are navigating this intersection of finance and cryptocurrency, perfect person for us to listen to today. So we'll explore several different key topics, such as the implementation of cryptocurrency for financial advisors into their practices, some due diligence around micro tokens and coins, and really just the evolution of the SMA product at Arbor Digital and so much more. But Mark, we are very, very, very excited to have you on today. Um, excited to be here, Jordan. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. So let's just kind of start things from the very beginning. Uh, can you tell us kind of your story, your background, uh, how you got into traditional finance, and then ultimately what got you into digital assets and cryptocurrency? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, it's a long story, but I'll try to keep it brief. Um, so I initially, you know, when I left uh, high school, um, I had made the leap into professional uh, sports, specifically tennis. I um, mean, you know, I had some a little bit of success. I was more in the minor leagues, if you will. Uh, the ATP tour is separated into a couple different tours. I was in the one just underneath the ATP tour, um, so called the ITF tour. I um, was coaching in between that. Um, but anyway, through my journeys there, I actually met um, in my local community uh, in Princeton, New Jersey, uh, a, a Merrill Lynch financial advisor. And you know, I had worked with his son. Um, and so I was coming to the end of my journey in my mid-20s. And uh, you know, he, you know, he kind of took me under his wing. Um, over at Merrill Lynch. And this was kind of at the the integration of when Mer Bank of America bought Merrill Lynch. Um, so it was very interesting just to see the business dynamics ha happening at that time. But at the end of the day, he was just a rock star advisor, just really cared about people. And I thought, you know what, this if I can mimic that, that's somewhere I'd want to be. But that's how I got into the business. Um, with that transition of BOA and, and Merrill Lynch there, you know, I kind of got a Got a sweetheart deal when I was coming into the business. Uh, so uh, I basically ended up transitioning to Charles Schwab to run my own book. Um, ended up doing pretty well over that time. Had a had a good amount of success. How you know how Charles Schwab defines success? Um, so they kind of tapped me on the shoulder to join this kind of elite team that goes into branch networks in their their high you know um, their high tier markets to consult with other high performing advisory branches uh, to kind of take what I was doing in the New York New Jersey markets. Um, and kind of distill that across the country with a, with a few others. So that's how I got in my more consulting uh, position. Um, then, you know, kind of went to TD Ameritrade after one of my former colleagues actually was trying to build a full wealth management service offer, uh, offering over at TD Ameritrade. And this was something completely new for TD Ameritrade. It was mostly a self-directed, uh, the client base is mostly self-directed. They didn't really delve too much into advice. They mostly had, you know, some advisor networks um, where they would actually refer business to RAAs um, in their local markets. But TD was like, you know what? We want to build something internal. Um, and so I was kind of tapped on the shoulder by a former colleague. So that's where I kind of got the product side of things, you know, developing a product from start to finish and then trying to distribute that product amongst a network of advisory uh, branches, or I'll call them firms, so to speak, um, in teams uh, across the country. And there are a lot of specific challenges that come with when you want to adopt, when you want your networks to adopt something as pivotal as more new products and services. It's not as easy as everyone thinks. There are so many uh, decisions that need to be made and it, it could have the best benefits in the world, but there are so many operational pieces, risk pieces that you need to think about when adopting new products or services, whether they're crypto or not, into an advisory practice. So I got to see that firsthand. And through that learning, I then 
ended up on this opportunity with Arbor Digital. I had been in a transition phase myself with Schwab coming in to purchase uh, TD Ameritrade. Um, I had made the decision to kind of go on my own, actually, then make the jump with, uh, with the integration. And so I ended up getting introduced to Matthew Kleski, who's the co-founder of Arbor Digital. Uh, we hit it off right away. I had been, you know, for me personally, my crypto journey started when I was an advisor in 2017 and, you know, Bitcoin's running up and I got so many people and the ICO craze that was happening. So I had a lot of clients who were in New York specifically who were calling me asking about like, what are, what are these crypto token things? It wasn't just Bitcoin, but it was the ICO boom. Um, so that initially is when I, my mind got introduced to it, but you know, I was, I was a curmudgeon at that point. I was like, don't pay attention to it. It's, it's beanie babies. Don't worry about it. It's going away. This isn't anything to pay attention to. Like we've got your financial plan. We've got your wealth strategies in place. It has, it's going to have no impact on that. So I started there. And then when I went on my own, I started doing the educational deep dive on like, what is actually happening? You know, what's blockchain doing? Why is it even here? What was it developed for answering all those, you know, uh, basic questions. And then I got hooked. Um, this, for me, this technology is infrastructure. And I think, you know, the infrastructure that which financial services operates on a global scale is due for an upgrade. <laughs> and, and it's like, we upgrade our Microsoft windows daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, but we haven't done anything like that in financial services. And I, I shouldn't say we haven't done anything. There have been small upgrades, but it's all just latching onto a base layer that was created decades ago. And then we're trying to just build and kind of on top of that, whereas we can now have that base layer infrastructure done. So once I realized that, and I met with Matthew Koleski and they, they were doing this for their clients or wanted to figure out how to do it for their clients. Um, I then came in and said, Hey, my background, my experience, I think there is an opportunity here. I think a lot of advisors are not going to understand this space a lot. We can be that for them. Why don't we just build a fully outsourced practice management, uh, uh, product and service for them. So they don't have to go build everything themselves. And we could just do that for them. And then we, we can be their trusted resource because that's what this business is based on is trust. Um, but I hope that answers the question. I hope it, I try to keep it concise, but that's how I got here. No, it does. It does. Perfect uh, framework there. And I love it. So to keep things, I guess, uh, traditional um, finance framework minded for those that are listening. Uh, so how you run the digital asset space there, is it more of like your funds are high growth funds per se? So you're invested in like these very small cap coins that could really blow up. Are you more of like a long and hold? Or are you like a dividend focus uh, type strategies that you're doing for a lot of these RAs by doing a lot of staking tokens, et cetera? Um, I guess trying to marry the two worlds together. Where do you guys find like your specialty or bread and butter? Absolutely. So our bread and butter is living within the current regulatory frameworks that we that we have now. So what we can do in our SMA specifically is, is in crypto tokens, is native crypto tokens, not crypto equities, not private fund structures like GBTC or, B, or the Bitwise 10, BITW, um, but more as, as close to the tokens as possible is the most efficient way to invest in them, is, our, is the way we approach this space. And then from a high level overview, it's, yeah, we consider this kind of almost liquid VC investing. This is the first time in history I can, we can do liquid VC investing. And so we take a long-term approach to figuring out what we think are going to be the protocols that are going to be the winners, or at least the, the who will be the new incumbents in this crypto asset space that's fusing with financial services and really not just financial services, but, uh, you know, business sectors across, uh, across different uh, specialties. Um, so we have it housed within uh, alternate, an alternative section of a portfolio. So we have kind of risk parameters in place. To where things don't get too crazy. Um, so we'll, you know, at Arbor Capital Management, which is an RA based in Alaska, which owns Arbor Digital. So the way we implement it there is we allocate up to 20% into alts for clients already. We actually, part of that alt exposure is the digital asset SMAs or, you know, your GPTCs if, if we feel it's not a good fit. Because again, vehicle is very important for owning. Not everyone is, the vehicle isn't always suitable for everyone. Um, so we will go up to 10% with, within that alternative section. So 10% of that 20%, um, which usually equates to maybe like a two to 5% overall allocation, which using traditional portfolio um, optimization software, uh, what we've seen has been kind of that, um, uh, what is it, that sweet spot so where you're hitting the efficient portfolios um, while not taking on too much risk. And then obviously need re rebalancing in place uh, to make sure that holistically that it does think the risk metrics don't get too out of hand. 
So then to make sure I'm on the same page with you, um, right now, like obviously in the traditional world, most advisors will recommend somewhere between 5%, maybe no more than 10% of a client's overall portfolio into alternative assets. Are you saying um, that 20% um, would be their total portfolio, or are you saying 20% of their alternative assets are going into cryptocurrency? I would say 10% of their alternative exposure, which could be up to 20%, will be in, could be in digital assets. That makes sense. So the overall 1% to 2% of somebody's total portfolio makes sense. Yep. Perfect. So then continuing forward with what you had just kind of said in regards to uh, the actual tokens that you're choosing. So when it actually comes to micro um, tokens or even just coins in general, what is the due diligence process that you recommend? Um, and how does that differ from traditional finance? Yeah, so there's a lot, there's actually a lot of similarities with traditional finance that you can apply to crypto tokens as as opposed to, you know, everyone wants you to think that everything is brand new when that's actually not true. So you can take a lot of so there's been a lot of data science, a lot of um, uh, what is it? Uh, studies shown to do modern portfolio theory, creating the efficient portfolio, the efficient frontier. You can use a lot of those same learnings to apply to crypto asset investing. Um, so we we start there first is, you know, how do we use um, we from a risk management standpoint, using all the same risk metrics that we all know and love standard deviation, you know, Sortino ratios, all of those things that we can understand currently in traditional space, you can apply that here. And it's about so we started from there. Um, and then most advisors or RAs are using some type of portfolio optimization, optimization software um, to implement their client portfolios on the traditional side. The challenge is, is a lot of that is not integrated into those traditional software pieces. That's kind of where we help come in with other RAAs is we show them we have a we have a specific uh, software solution that we use, which is called CloudWall, where we can you know kind of optimize for the portfolios, stress test the portfolios, gain intelligence and insights that are specifically geared towards crypto tokens. Um, and that's kind of where we start there. Uh, when we talk about that micro diligence there. So creating a portfolio that has um, the big difference is, is when you're doing more of the qualitative and when you're trying to incorporate the new data field of what we call on chain data, right? That's when you start getting into what's new about the assets and the asset class. The, the thing about on chain data is that it's so new. There hasn't been that, you know, decades long of research studies and data science to see what is statistically significant to actually give portfolio insights based on on-chain data. There are a lot of short-term technicals that have been developed in the on-chain data field, which is great. We use those for you know more of the cash allocation decisions. But when you're talking long-term investment thesis and what uh, data points actually showcase uh, the long-term viability of these networks and these protocols, that's where there's still a huge gap. And that's where we you know hire, we have a couple of on-chain data providers. A couple we have are digital asset research great provider for us. We've been partnering with them since we launched the portfolios. Um, they actually provide pricing and uh, data research for uh, Bloomberg and uh, FTSE Russell indices. And then we use uh, another firm called DeFi Safety, which is more of your crypto native research, um, where we go into and they do what, what they call process quality reviews for DeFi uh, tokens or, and networks. And then they also do on-chain quality reviews, which is kind of looking at the, the blockchain itself and seeing about the quality from a technical standpoint. So where that's kind of the new field, right? That is, we're trying to figure out and we're doing a lot of that work now, but it's just going to take a lot of time to really see what's statistically significant. Um, but that's kind of where we go. And then we also have our own qualitative review, just like you would do a normal traditional finance. If I'm a VC investor and I'm going to look at um, some of these early projects and networks, I'm going to ask in the major questions, you know, what's the product market fit? What's the thing they're solving? What's the real world problem that this network is solving for? And is it even worth being solved for? Or what are the what's the competitor analysis? And then I think one thing that was missing a lot in the in the early years is a lot more due diligence and focus on the people behind the networks. Because we love to say that technology is coming in and disrupting everything, but the the fact is there are still people. And I would say the two core uh, groups of people we look at when we're doing qualitative reviews are first the executive suite, the founders, co-founders, the people from the beginning who are leading the other people underneath and leading the, the charge of the, you know, the, the, what is it? The white paper, the 
uh, the roadmap that they're developing, who's leading all of those things from a people standpoint, what are their motivations? Where do they come from? Um, and then I think the second uh, community that we do a lot of work in on the micro side is the core developer community communities within these networks and protocols. Cause that's kind of the dirty secret of the, of the industry right now is that actually core developers are kind of ones that hold the keys to the castles. A lot of the time with these networks and protocols, they're the ones you really need to pay attention to. Um, a lot, there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of things, you know, crypto Twitter is a thing, but, um, but core developers are very, very integral. So that's kind of, that's a broad overview of how we conduct micro, uh, micro due diligence on the tokens. Fascinating. Um, definitely a lot deeper of a dive than I've heard a lot of other people that are trying to help support the RA space. Uh, so for those RAs that obviously have been following us, that have been reaching out to us, inquiring about these aspects, um, highly recommend that they pursue you and uh, can't wait uh, to see the, the stuff that you all build, which is a perfect segue into the SMA product that you all created uh, about three years ago now. So I'm kind of curious from, from a high level perspective, many RAs have come to us and said, Hey, a lot of our, the qualified custodians in the market we want to work with, the Coinbase's, the Gemini's, the Bitcoin's, et cetera, all seem to have this uphill battle um, with an SMA type structure. So can you kind of elaborate on what your product is, um, some of the challenges, um, even the opportunities and the successes and learnings you've had over the last three years and where it's going? Absolutely. So again, the first challenge that we have to solve for when we're looking to take, and that's where I'll say the SMA is actually, so we take discretion over client. That's the big word is taking discretion because there are other ways you can help investors with their crypto asset investment needs that don't require you having discretion or taking custody. There are self custody solutions then you can do at assets held away, uh, those things like that. So us specifically, we wanted to build a solution because the majority of financial advisors, the way their businesses are operationally set up is to take discretion over client assets without taking custody. And there are some advisors that do actually take custody. Um, so that's where we wanted to build this SMA structure. Uh, for those advisors that want to take discretion, bring it under their billing, build, bring it under their, um, their roof, so that way they can have the risk controls in place to be able to manage the investments effectively, which is the same story for any other asset class that, are, is, that has ever been introduced to the financial advisor's practices whether it's alts, whether it's, you know, equities or fixed income or any, you know, uh, preferred stock or any other type of asset class to where you can take discretion for clients. There's a reason why that uh, business model exists. And it's very, very important. Um, you know, for advisors, I know for me, one of the biggest things is when you're an advisor, a lot of people think it's all about the decisions we help them make when actually a lot, we actually make decisions more based on what we don't decide to do as opposed to the actions we implement. There are many more decisions we don't do than we actually implement. So I think that's where the value comes in and why discretion is so important because you can wake up one day when you don't have discretion, you don't have them under your purview where clients are making decisions that go against an advisor's recommendations. And then it's, so we don't want to fall in that situation. So that's a big reason why. And the second reason we went with the SMA approach was we want the clients as close to the assets as possible. When you take, you know, a crypto equity exposure or a private placement or a fund structure, you know, a lot of these can really uh, fluctuate uh, relative to NAV, you know, extreme discounts, extreme um, premiums, and it's just an inefficient way. And also they're on normal rails, which Friday at four o'clock, they're stopping. This asset class never stops. So, you know, if you're going to try to protect your investors, you need to be able to trade effectively 24-7, 365, just like the asset class. Um, so that's where... All of the challenges come up with how do you do that in a regulated way, in a risk managed way? And that's what we do. And that's kind of why we built the SMA structure and what we have available for advisors is we have all of the risk parameters and processes in place for this asset class specifically. Um, and that's kind of what we help advisors do because that's the first thing they come to us with is, well, operationally, I don't know how to do this. Like to go get E&O insurance, I have to go showcase to the underwriters what I'm doing from a risk management standpoint to protect the practice. And if I'm not doing, if I don't have a lot, then, you know, I'm going to be paying premiums out the wazoo as opposed to being able to do that uh, efficiently for my business. And again, most of them don't. So then they decide not to just because from a compliance and operational standpoint, it's, it's not easy. And that's why that's kind of the service we provide and we help with the SMA structure. Um, and then I guess when we go there, uh, the things that it's all about practice management, right? When we talk about from a risk managed perspective, 
you know, advisors are not just in charge of helping people with investments. It comes down to wealth management. And again, you mentioned one of my certifications. Uh, one of the value adds of advisors is there's so many different areas that advisors add value to someone's you know financial situation over their life cycles that come out way more than just the investment. We've only just figured out how to charge on investments. <laughs> like that's where the that's the that's the big gap. And I think that's evolving over time. Um, but having the parameters in place for when people have tax needs or estate planning needs or other wealth management needs when it comes to protecting what they've earned, that's where we come in and we have the strategic strategic partners in the space. Um, and I'll give them a shout out right now, you know, Polygon Advisory, who who is a great tax partner for us. They, you know, 20 years in the business working at some of the big four and they're bringing all the same uh, techniques for us. Um, that's a huge value add. Um, so when you take direct discretion and you, then you take direct exposure, it introduces so many more things, but we've got the blueprint for you. So then it can expand off of that. The RAs that you're currently working with right now are really just like independent, any independent financial advisors. Um, jurisdictionally and regulatory wise, are these specifically domiciled only in the United States or are you also working with people based in any other jurisdictions globally? So we are only servicing U.S. registered advisors, whether you're state registered or SEC registered. Um, you know, our clients range from 50 million AUM to your single practitioner to your 4 billion AUM firm with, you know, a full advisory team, maybe across different advisory groups. Um, so um, it's fully in the U.S. However, we do kind of consult with other practices that are more global. So an example would be in the U.K. We have a couple of clients also in LATAM or Latin America. Uh, we have a few advisors who have, have contacted us and we kind of consult with them to help them understand uh, the basic pieces to integrating a full discretion, direct exposure uh, investment solution for clients. Awesome. Great. So then um, kind of like one of the last questions here would be, what are some of the common questions or misconceptions that you keep getting from advisors that are trying to enter the space that are coming to you to seek for advice or help um, just based on where we're currently at in the market with the recent Bitcoin ETF approval? Um, where, where do you see the most common RIA landing and where do they truly need the most help? Yeah. So the first misconception I'll say is that you don't need to get educated and become a blockchain. If you're an advisor, it's, and that's where I get a little frustrated with a lot of people who are in the space and some that are dear friends of ours, you know, they're like, you need to get educated. You need to become an expert. You need to go get this accreditation. And that's where we completely differ. I'm going to say, no, you don't need to do that. Um, that's a lot of energy, time, and resources. Um, most people won't do that. And the example I'll give is, you know, anytime an advisor is looking to get access to a, you know, more esoteric asset class, let's say more alternative based, like private equity, private debt, or things that just aren't as attuned, they're not going to go spin themselves up on what private equity, they're probably going to either hire someone or a team to build it internally, or they're just going to hire a third party, whichever is most efficient, whichever fits their business needs the most. And that is going to be the same thing here. So that's the first misconception. What we say to do and said is just don't be ignorant to the space, become aware of the space and then become aware of who can help you. And I think that's where we, we live right now is if you're an advisor, you're not going to want to spend all the time, energy and effort. And by the way, the money resources to then go spin this up on your own, just reach out to us. We've been in the business. We've been doing this for three years. We already have the blueprint set out. That's where we live. Um, the second misconception is I hear a common thing that says, uh, Oh, um, what is it? Um, slowly, but then all at once or something like that with the adoption of advisors. And I'm going to say, absolutely not. Given my experience with releasing products and services in traditional wealth management across large advisor networks, it does not happen all at once. It is going to be a slow burn over the next few years. And then one day, yes, you will wake up and you're going to see that as long as you're consistent and you're getting the small wins every day, you're going to see it just like compounding interest you're going to see that the business will be successful. So that's where I'm going to say that it's still going to take time. So you need to work with people who are committed and live and breathe in this space as opposed to people who kind of do this as a passive thing, or maybe just kind of, we call them uh, what tourists in the industry. And that's kind of where we want to fit in too. We are committed and disciplined to this space. And we understand the needs of advisors as well as the needs of investment managers who need to implement this in a safe and secure way within a broader practice.
Perfect, perfect. So then for anybody that's listening, I would obviously first and foremost recommend if you're an advisor and you're trying to figure out, hey, what do I do in this situation? Just reach out to Mark and everybody at Arbor Digital and just partner. It'd make your lives a lot easier. Um, so to, to prime this final and last question here, those advisors right now that to your point are not educated, they don't know what's going on, they're feeling overwhelmed. What advice would you give to those so that their clients are coming to them and saying, the next bull run's almost here. It's about to start. I don't want to lose out on this. Don't make me wait a couple more years until there's further clarity and really anything um, that kind of unnecessary panic, in my opinion, what, what kind of advice would you give to those in that scenario? Yeah, absolutely. Again, I think it goes back to what I mentioned before is you don't need to go get spun up and educated and become a blockchain expert. Where you need to start is really just doing a survey of your practice to see, is this an actual business need? And that's kind of one of the, where we first start. So we just launched our consulting services. So that's where I, that's my suggestion is if you're an advisor and you're starting to get those client state, your financial planners are starting to get those statements and you're noticing Coinbase, you're noticing MetaMask and you're noticing uh, banks or like Custodia or um, other banks and institutions like Gemini. Um, and you're noticing things on statements when your financial planners are going and building out, you know, your holistic financial plans. Um, that's where then you should be triggered. That's where I'd start. Are you noticing anything on statements? Are you noticing anything when you see a flow of funds between your clients to any of those entities? The second thing is you need to go to, so first is your client base, right? You need to go to your client base, survey them. Is this an actual need for your clients? Is this going to be uh, a meaningful impact to you and your business? Uh, the second is where you need to go is with your advisory teams. One of the interesting dynamics that we've seen now is when we talk to advisory teams, and again, I'm saying more on the between, you know, your 300 million AUM to your 4 billion AUM, you know, these advisory teams that have 10 to 30, um, many of them are investing personally, but they aren't allowed to go out and be uh, and solicit and do uh, and give proactive advice. They can only take unsolicited orders. Um, so there's this weird dynamic where a lot of advisors are doing it personally. So that's where I would say if you're an executive right now at any at your firm, um, compliance officer, CIO, uh, CCO, whoever, I think your first thing is you need to get a handle of what's going on within your business. So working with your advisory teams and your next strategy meeting, just ask your advisory teams, hey, does, what, what are your thoughts on investing in crypto assets? Does anybody here do it personally? And then what you're finding and what we found is actually a lot of advisors may be a little shameful, a little guilt ridden that they are doing it and they won't speak up because obviously you put yourself, um, you expose yourself and you're, you're a little bit at risk. So your executive teams, you need to go to your uh, advisors per personally and individually to see, are you investing? Is this something we need to implement with our clients? And that's where I would say um, everyone should start. Just do a need, uh, a need or demand assessment of your business. Start with the clients, then your advisory teams, and then decide if the juice is worth the squeeze. And if it is, great. Let us be your first resource. If it's not and you want to build internally, we, we can also help you with our consulting services on where to go, where to start. But that would be my advice for any RIA listening right now. Really great advice. Really great advice. Mark, I appreciate you being on the podcast today. So for those that are listening, what's the best way for them to reach out to you and Arbor Digital? Absolutely. Two main ways. First is just go to our website, arborddigital.io, or follow us on LinkedIn. We are very, very active on LinkedIn. Um, we do post a lot of free resources there and through our weekly newsletter. Um, so those are the two main spots. Awesome. Thanks so much for being on the show. For those of you that are listening, please reach out to Mark. Go check out Arbor Digital um, and go on and sign up if, if you're an RIA or anybody else that's interested in consulting services, et cetera. Highly recommend it. Um, and thank you again for being on the show and stay tuned for the next episode of Decentral Lounge. Have a good one. Thanks, Jordan.